What sparked your early interest in mathematics? Well, there's the spark and then there's the lasting flame. The, the spark is that um, some of the two of my best friends uh, liked to meet after school and read uh, books about math when I was when we were in high school. And they, I, I asked me to join them, and um, one of their grandfathers, I think, really loved working on elementary problems, so he would egg us on. And I was just so happy. Um, I was good at it. And so that might be the spark. I happen to be lucky that, you know, the mathematics a researcher does has nothing to do with uh, the stuff you learn in high school. Uh, I was, I consider myself very lucky that somehow the mathematics I do today, I love more than ever. I understand you also considered becoming a conductor. How did you end up choosing that? For conducting for me was fascinating because you get to think about a piece of music. You get to figure out what's its structure, what's behind it. Uh, and then you somehow, with one move of the finger, you get a hundred people to express your thoughts about that piece of music. Um, why did I choose math? Again, that could have been an accident. You know, at McGill, um, I talked to the, uh, the uh, best conducting professor. He invited me to his home. Uh, we had a great chat, and I thought I was going to do both. But then arts and science didn't think that this deserved credit. And so... I stuck with math, partly thinking that, what if I become a conductor and there's no orchestra to conduct? Whereas from my days in high school, uh, I knew that I can sit and do my mathematics on a piece of paper uh, without an orchestra. Did you ever consider becoming a composer? Uh, no. Whatever tiny bit I composed was way too simplistic. People were... Um, other people were a lot better than, at it than I am. Before. And how did Charles Beckerman become your PhD advisor? Let's see. So for that, for that we have to go back a little bit to my undergraduate years at McGill, where uh, Carl Hertz, who was a great mathematician, unfortunately passed away. Um, I think he he inspired my taste. And so when I, uh, when it was time to apply for grad school, uh, and I was asking him how is uh, this school versus that school and what's their ethos, he said, just go to Princeton. And, um, so I liked analysis and I was at Princeton. And if you would hear uh, a Charlie Pfefferman lecture, um, people would walk out of there completely awed and inspired, so that when he accepted me as a student, I was elated. And how did his advising style influence your PhD research experience? Oh, completely. I, I was uh, just had three years of undergraduate math from McGill. Um, he had an amazing overview of the field, and so... Um, on the first or second day we met, he made a list of problems he felt were important. And those problems influenced the ones I chose and the ones I didn't choose at that time. Uh, influenced my path for a while. What was it like to be a student of Charles Fatima? I consider it uh, an immense privilege. Um, mathematically, um, Charlie could see further than anyone. And coupled with that, he, he was a model human being. Um, uh, it was also uh, scary. You know, he has very high standards and you had to work very, very hard. How did you first get interested in mathematics and math coaching? Ah, uh, that's another story. So in Princeton, I developed a great love for harmonic analysis. And uh, I, 
after Princeton, um, I I thought that um, by talking to people, it, it felt to me like that um, scattering and inverse scattering um, problems were a version of nonlinear uh, harmonic analysis. So they would sort of lead you on a practical problem, lead you by the nose into developing some of the beautiful um, discoveries in harmonic analysis and push them towards uh, new nonlinear problems. Um, and then I gave a talk about, I was then later at Rochester, I gave a talk about this and um, uh, my uh, friend uh, Robert Wagg, I, whom I didn't know at the time, was in the audience, and he was uh, an engineer, a superb engineer, working on medical ultrasound. And he had various ideas on how to uh, improve medical ultrasound, how to use it in reliable ways to detect breast cancer, um, but the measurements he were making gave data that was too complicated to unscramble. And he thought after my lecture that I was just the guy to talk to. And so I joined that team. Um, and what I liked about medical imaging as opposed to inverse scattering from physics is that um, you have more um, choice in the kinds of data you can collect. So I could talk to my engineering friend and, you know, and I would say, you know, if we could put, make measurements of this kind and that kind, that would uh, dovetail well with what can be recovered. Um, whereas in physics or, let's say, in oil exploration, you have much less of a choice. People go, they do make measurements out in the lab or on the field. They bring you the data and now do what you can with it. So that's one aspect of medical imaging. Um, again, that sparked it. Since then, I've learned a lot about the field. Um, and I think it's fantastic because on the one hand, um, it can, uh, it somehow demands and can make use of, uh, some very recent advanced mathematics, um, things like abstract things you might not think of, like differential geometry, um, which are being used in several areas of medical imaging. Um, and on the other hand, uh, you're helping people. And there's a whole spectrum of, you know, you get to talk to engineers who build things, you get to talk to doctors, to experimenters. So um, I like this aspect of uh, one day talking to uh, colleagues in pure mathematics who... Um, think about the differential uh, geometry problems I'm interested in because of medical imaging, uh, and the next day uh, talking to someone who was at the Sunnybrook Hospital making an MRI experiment and hearing what happened to their circuits and what went wrong and how we can fix that and so forth. So um, this variety uh, of... and spectrum of things to think about is uh, quite attractive. And what problems are you working on right now? You might say, well, we have in medical imaging, we have CT machines, we have MRI machines, we have ultrasound machines. Why do we need new machines? Well, each of them uh, gives you different information about, um, uh, about your, your body. And we function electrochemically. And so I'm interested in imaging the electric properties of tissue, which cannot be obtained by the method I just mentioned. Um, and again, on the one hand, that has led to a uh, problem some people describe as pure math. I don't like so much to delineate, as I said, I'm, I'm sp spent my, uh, my whole life trying to erase these boundaries. Right now, for instance, I'm, uh, I'm organizing two huge programs, one for my tax, uh, a focus period on the mathematics of medical imaging, and one here at the Fields Institute on inverse problems and imaging. Um, 
And so far, my biggest joy has been that it's been a surprise to everyone. It's been a surprise to mathematicians how many uh, interesting, difficult problems there are. Um, the, ma the deep mathematics that some of their colleagues that they didn't know about are doing in the medical imaging. It's been a surprise to doctors um, how much mathematics can help in some of the things they're thinking about. Um, I've had people like uh, engineering colleagues in biomed come to me and say, you know, I go to big conferences and you hear a lot about incremental progress. I came to this conference and 80% of the talks <clears throat> were amazing new ideas. Um, interesting, exciting, I had never thought about uh, that can completely change how one approaches some of these problems. Um, now I forget what the question was. It was what problems are you working on? Oh, again? right. So, uh, right. So I'm interested in uh, both the mathematical and the engineering aspects of uh, how to find uh, electric properties of tissue. And your research relates a lot to industry, a lot to uh, practical medicine, would you say? Okay. There's a lot of steps between the mathematics and the industrial. You have to... Um, first, you figure out how something works and uh, whether it's possible to do. Then you find a method to do it. Uh, then you might talk to someone... Um, who's uh, good at uh, writing computer code on how to do it on a computer. Then you talk to experimentalists to try it out. Then you talk to doctors to, uh, to tell you what you can see there and what, how to modify the method to make it useful to them. And, and so the, the lead time to actually building something new in a company is rather lo long in this particular field. Um, so uh, it's very practical. We're interested in, in new ways to, uh, to image the body, um, but they are completely new. And so the typical in industrial uh, company is working more on incremental progress on existing methods rather than... So this, think of this as the new generation of uh, imaging methods. And do you find that a lot of people understand um, how many steps there are to get to that point where we can go to a hospital and we can be imaged? It depends whom you ask. Uh, I don't think uh, I, I, I don't think the public understands. I don't think my mathematician colleagues understand. Uh, I think that the people who build those machines understand that very well. And I think even in people in engineering who are somehow between the mathematics and the industrial also understand that there are many steps. Um, so everyone thinks that their end of it is the more important, but I, I feel that um, all these steps are important and, and need to be put together to get to the product. When you're choosing your problems, what you're going to work on, do you think about those steps when you choose the problems? I think about those steps. Some people are interested in, in making things. Uh, I'm more interested in understanding things. My prejudice is that understanding fundamental and difficult questions then uh, helps in many industries. So, for instance... Um, a major recent discovery in math is um, this uh, theory of compressed sensing, uh, which in its current form is about seven years old. Uh, we'll have some of this in the program here at Fields. Um, it came out of mathematicians trying to understand um, something observed in MRI that if one is clever about it, there's a way to obtain images that are 
uh, completely accurate with a lot less measurements than all the classical sampling theory uh, that you're taught in school <coughs> would predict. So now, subsampling is a huge problem. Um, if you want to observe from the Earth from space, you have fewer sensors than you would like. Um, if you want to transmit over a phone line, you have fewer frequencies than you would like if you want a lot of bandwidth. Um, I mean, to fit a lot of things in given bandwidth. Um, so here's an example where uh, figuring out something then spawned a, a theory which is now, they're literally in five years, thousands of papers in completely different areas, geophysics, uh, you know, astronomy, uh, imaging, uh, building chips, uh, all of which use compressed sensing. Uh, colleagues in engineering are doing it. For instance, here's a, a very simple question. Um, you have um, hotspots for, for wireless. Um, so I turn on my laptop and I can see uh, which hotspots I'm detecting, and uh, I know where the hotspots are in, in Bayen. All right, where am I? Based on that information. Uh, I have a colleague who used compressed sensing to, uh, to find a very good algorithm to do that. Um, one would have never thought of that, uh, uh, had one try to solve directly that problem as opposed to, for instance, understanding the one that came out of MRI. So I think if I were to do only uh, industrially directed questions, I would do lesser work. How does the Chicago School of Analysis inform the work that you do now? I'm very proud to be a descendant of the Chicago School of Analysis. Um, with Charlie Pfefferman and his advisor, Eli Stein, Coming to Princeton, I guess some of the best part of that school became the Princeton School of Analysis. Um, it so happens, um, and again, I learned this after the fact, that uh, some of my uh, work on uh, inverse scattering uh, could be uh, the, the methods developed there could be used to uh, attack a problem that had been uh, suggested by Calderon. Now Calderon, uh, who was one of the towering figures of the Chicago School, uh, had uh, suggested that in connection with geophysics. Uh, he had no idea that it would be taken up by the medical imaging community, and it is now one of the uh, seminal problems around which the mathematics of medical imaging has, has been uh, developed. Um, separately from that, I happened to use some other methods that Calderon developed in other papers. Um, and so I feel I'm a lucky and humble descendant of the Chicago School. How would you describe the experience of discovery? A great idea uh, gives you great joy. I mean, it, it gets me all excited. I have to. I can't sit down. I have to walk around for half an hour. But then I sit down and I realize it's wrong. And then maybe I have another idea. Um, and once in a while, these work out, and that's a great joy. But finding that they have might take a year's worth of work. And so it's incremental every day. You push a little further, you figure out what is and what isn't true. Um, and by the time it's all put together, uh, you've been with this for so long that it's, I don't know if you can describe the experience of discovery. Looking back, uh, you're, of course, 
tremendously excited that you were able to uh, find some structure that somehow nobody else could see. Um, and that happens to be interesting and useful and beautiful. <laughs>